Chicken and the fish went out. But I'm grateful to God for this opportunity and grateful to Pastor Hamilton for inviting me to share in this moment. It is such a wonderful moment to celebrate with the Shiloh family as you begin this new season of leadership. God has been good to you. And I am excited for you over what the Lord is going to do. So let me share with you what I believe God has laid on my heart. I won't be before you long. I've been practicing a new beatitude and those blessed are the brief, but they will be invited back. And so if I had to share a text, it would come out of the book of Joshua chapter 4, verses 18 through 24. And the text says there, and the priest came up out of the river, carrying the covenant of the Lord. And no sooner had they set their feet on dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. On the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal 12 stones that they had taken out of the Jordan. And he said to the Israelites, in the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. And I want to tag that text with a title, Don't Forget to Remember. Would you give that subject to your neighbor in between your chewing your food, just swallow, and say, don't forget to remember. Don't forget to remember. You know, for a book, for a book that is about military conquest, when you read the book of Joshua, it surely skimps on military details. We are never told what weapons he used, how many officers he had, how many men made up each battalion? Did he have an elite Delta fighting force? And if so, what training regiment did he require? The answer to these and so many other questions we don't know. And we don't know because the emphasis in the narrative of Joshua is not on the physical battle, but on the spiritual one. The real conflict of the Israelites was not with the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, or even the Shilites, but it was with Satan and his demons. Yes, somebody got it, somebody didn't. It was with Satan and his demons. Canaan was the choicest real estate on the planet. It connected Africa with Europe. It accessed the Mediterranean Sea. It was marked by lush valleys and fertile fields. And most importantly, the land was God's gift to Israel. Nearly seven centuries earlier, God had told Abram in the book of Genesis, to your descendants, I will give this land. God set this property apart for his people and his people apart to be a blessing to the world. And God promised Abram, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. This amalgamated assortment of bad lands Bedouins would become the couriers of God's covenant to a galaxy of people around the globe. Israel would literally be the parchment on which the redemption story of God would be written. The city of Jerusalem, the town of Bethlehem, the sacrifices of the temple, the prophecies of the prophets would all unfold on this land. The Redeemer would be born here, walk here, live here, and he would soak this dirt with his blood and shake this ground with his resurrection. Because the book of Joshua isn't about claiming real estate for a dislocated nation, but it's about God preserving a stage for his plan of redemption. And 
Satan's counter strategy was clear. Contaminate the promised land and preempt the promised child. Destroy God's people and dismantle God's work. And so Joshua's battle then was a spiritual one. And can I suggest to you over your chicken this afternoon, so is ours. Our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and the powers of this world's darkness, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And that's why beginning the day and every day following, when the Lord opens your eyes, you need to put on the whole armor of God. Smile at somebody and say, put it all on. Put it all. See, I recognize that this idea of evil, or abstract or incarnate, strikes many of us as modern contemporaries as being antiquated, old-fashioned, out of date. Ah. Because the popular trend in our time is to blame all of our issues on the government, on genetics, on our environment. And yet the Bible presents a very real and present foe to our advance. And the scriptures personify and name this presence as Satan. He is not the cute and harmless character of our cartoons. He is not an imaginary dark counterpart to the Easter Bunny. He is the bunny. He is the invisible yet forceful fallen angel called Lucifer who desired the high place that only God can occupy. He rebelled, he disobeyed, he had to be put in check, and he fell. And he wants you and I to do the same thing. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, The devil your enemy goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And any person, any church, who has ever dared to draw near to God has already felt the enemy's attack. Look at your neighbor and say, I know that's right. He has three primary objectives, and this is Jesus speaking. In John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And I have a positive message wrapped up in a negative package because in this moment of celebration, I want to remind you that not everybody is happy about what's going on because the enemy is ticked off at you. All this talk about God being good and God being great and the Lord has kept us and the rest of our days are going to be the best of our days has put the devil in a foul mood. Your days struggling did not trouble him. Your nights lost did not bother him. But now you have the nerve, the unmitigated gall to think about, talk about, and move towards a fortuitous future yep. by the grace of God. Yep. You dare to walk in faith and not in fear. You dare to lean on grace and not in guilt. You dare to hear God's voice more and listen to the enemy's voice less. I need to tell you squarely, Shiloh, that the enemy has you in his gun sights. You are on the enemy's hit list, but don't get scared because you're also on Jesus' mailing list. And as long as you're on his mailing list, the hit list don't matter. You are in enemy territory, just as Joshua was, because in our text for the first time in nearly five centuries, Hebrews were camping in Canaan. This was the moment they had been waiting for. This was the hour they had dreamt about. How many times that they gazed across the Jordan at this lush land. And some of them, like Joshua and Caleb, had been waiting for 45 years. And somebody at a table near you knows what it is to hold on to a promise from God when all you have is a promise for a long, long time. And so when God opened the waters of the Jordan, they didn't have to wait to be asked twice. Joshua 4.13 reports that all told about 40,000 soldiers crossed over the Jordan onto the plains of Jericho. They were ready for battle. They hurried across with a shout, a hoot, and a holler. And had not God stopped them, they would have run straight on in to the fortified city of Jericho. But God didn't stop them because they were not quite ready for their next conflict.
conquest. It's as if he wanted to give them one more word. I'm thinking now of my mother who birthed into this world 17 children, and I am the 15th. She was five foot one, a hundred pounds on a good day, and yet when she sent us off to school on the first day each year, her message was exactly the same. With our lunchbox full, breakfast now eaten, jackets and school supplies in tow, all of us excited to get out of the door, she would stop us on the front porch. And after a while, we knew what was coming. My mother would get on eye level with each child one by one. And she said the same thing. She says, you go out of here today. I want you to remember what I taught you. I want you to remember who you are. I want you to remember whose you are. Because you are a Watson, and you bet not embarrass this family. And that's exactly what God did in the text. God brought their impending invasion to a halt. And by virtue of a couple of commands, he prepared the Hebrews for the land of promise. It's all there in Joshua 4. Joshua assembled a dozen men, one from each tribe, to go back to the riverbed, to the very area where the priest's feet had stood. They dislodged 12 stones. As the people watched and the flow resumed its height, Joshua stacked those stones. And when the 12th rock was securely in the top spot, he turned to the people and said, in the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? You ought to let them know we crossed the Jordan on dry ground. So what is the secret to survival in enemy territory? Here it is. I won't keep you waiting. I'm going to get to it before your dessert get to you. Look, here's the first step. You've got to remember what God has already done. Look at your neighbor and say, God's already done some stuff. Yeah, see, you got to remember. This is a day of remembrance. You got to remember and record God's accomplishments in your memoirs. Capture this crossing in your memory before you look forward to Jericho. Make sure you look backward to Jordan and remember what God has already done. At least be as consistent as Facebook. I don't know how many of you are social media oriented, but I'm a techno pastor. I'm in all things technical. And if you do Facebook, you realize that Facebook has a feature that they put on display on everybody's page where they will, without your permission, go back into your postings and pull up pictures and texts and tweets that you may have shared two, four, six years ago, and they will remind you of what you were thinking, what you were saying, and what you were doing back then. And that's the minimum that each of us ought to do in our relationship with God. Somewhere in your archive, you should have some text messages some snapshots, yeah. some posts, and some reminders yeah. of what God has already done for you. And periodically, without provocation, you ought to pull them up. See, some years ago, my daughter reminded me of this truth. I was driving her to middle school, and I wasn't talking as I normally do. She looked over and said, you're mighty quiet today. And I said, baby, I've got some deadlines I've got to meet. And kids are not always clued in to what their parents are going through. So she said, well, have you ever had any deadlines before? I said, yes. She said, how many? I said, I don't know, hundreds, maybe thousands of deadlines. She said, well, have you ever missed any of those before? I said, not for the most part. She said, so let me get this right. In the past, God has helped you to meet hundreds, maybe thousands of headlines already. I said, yes. She said, well, it seems to me, even though I'm only in the ninth grade, that if God has helped you to meet hundreds, maybe thousands of headlines before, don't you think he can help you meet one? Stack some stones, Dad. 
because Satan has no recourse to your testimony. Your best weapon against an enemy attack is a good memory. Don't forget a single blessing. Remember, God forgives all your sins. God heals all your diseases. God crowns you with love, mercy, and peace. God gives you joy, unspeakable and full of glory. God wraps every day in his goodness. God renews your youth like the eagles. God sustains your peace even in the time of trouble. God makes everything come out right, work out right, end up right. Won't he do it? Yeah. yeah I, I, like, I like Psalm 103, verse 6. It says, he puts victims back up on their feet. You ought to create a trophy room in your heart. And every time you experience a victory, put a memory on yourself. Before you face your next challenge, take a quick tour of God's accomplishments. Think about for a moment, and I know you don't want to get riled up because your food is out in front of you and you're in your good clothes this afternoon. But just think about it in your mind. And if you don't want to wave your hand or open your voice, just tap your toes inside your shoes. Yeah. Think about it for a moment. All the paychecks he's provided, all the blessings he has given, Who you were, but you belong to me. No longer slaves, 
you free. No longer incarcerated, you've been liberated. God's message to the Hebrews, remember whose you are. And God's message to us, I want you to remember whose you are. Because whether you are male or female, if you are a child of God, if you are a believer in Jesus, that means you've been circumcised. Maybe not physically, but that's why you can't be a two-verse Bible reader. Because if you go over to Colossians 2.11, it says when you came to Christ, he set you free. Not by a bodily operation of circumcision, but by a spiritual operation, the baptism of your soul. What you're trying to say, preacher, I'm trying to say he cut away all the stuff you don't need. He cut away your issues, your fears, and your phobias. He cut away your depression. He cut away your despair. He cut away your dysfunction. When you gave your heart to him, he gave his power to you. You are not the person that you used to be. And you are only a fraction of the person you are about to be. God is at work in your life. And so you need to put people on notice that I'm no longer who I used to be. But God is making me into somebody new. Because there ain't nothing you've ever been through that will be wasted in the plan of redemption. God never wastes a wound. In fact, God finds value in things that we throw away. One of my other sons in the ministry, Pastor Hamilton, Larry Ennis, was talking to me about his favorite his favorite store is Walmart. He said when he was in college, he didn't have a lot of money. So he had to do all this shopping at Walmart. And he said, Pastor, I started using those Walmart bags as freezer bags. Reason being, why pay money for a glad freezer bag when you get these Walmart bags for free? He shared with me, he said, I had to buy a family pack of chicken wings, but I would break them down into about three or four wings apiece. I would put them in that Walmart bag, and I would freeze them, and they would turn out just right. He said, Pastor, you don't understand. He said, a Walmart bag is a multi-purpose bag. I said, what you say? He said, yeah, it's a tote bag, it's a laundry bag, it's a jam bag.
kids in here go to school. She's in pre-K four, and she loves to draw. And so whenever Papa's home, we got to get out the books and we got to draw. We got to color. And not long ago, we were working together on one of her workbooks. And as she was drawing, I looked down, and all of her lines were crooked. I, I saw, you know, but you can't break them down like right away. You kind of got to ease into it. So I said, Great, this is really good. You're doing a real good job. I said, But baby, have you noticed uh, that your lines are crooked? And that old four year old stood up and said, Papa, I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> and, and I said, Well, baby, can I introduce you to something? She said, Yeah. I said, you see this right here? She said, yeah. I said, do you know what that is? She said, no. I said, this is a ruler. I said, and a ruler is designed to help you. You need a ruler because the ruler will help you keep your stuff straight. Y'all oh slow. And I want to tell somebody here, don't you live another crooked year trying to live life all by yourself. You need a ruler. and live out your inheritance because God is doing something new in Shiloh. God is doing something new in New Jersey. God has blessed Shiloh. God is watching over his people. God is preparing your future. God is ensuring that the best is yet to come. So how do you survive? Well, you know the devil going to be busy. Well, remember what God has already done. Yeah. Remember whose you are. But then there's one final thing, and I'm out of your way. This show is so quick, I guarantee it's going to go over your head. Because the third point that I want to make is this. Remember where you are. Wait, and where were they? Almost there. That went right over here. Let me say it again. Do you know where they were? Almost there. Don't quit when you're almost there. Yeah, Don't yeah. Give up when yeah. you're almost there. Don't throw in the towel when you're almost there. You may want to cry. You may want to walk away. You may want to give up. But keep saying to yourself, it won't be as long as it has been. And you only got a minute, only 60 seconds in it, forced upon you, can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to you to use it. You'll suffer if you lose it, you'll give an account if you abuse it. Shiloh, it's only a minute, but your future is in it. Do the talk on. Walmart bag. 
Although that brother got me thinking, I should think of some other things I should use with my Walmart bags. But um, we'll just take a few minutes and then we'll move on to a pastoral tribute um, section of our program. Amen?